Welcome to CES 2026. I'm Faith Pitto, and I'm at the Foundry in Las Vegas, joined now by very special guest, Joe Paleska, who is the CMO of Commonwealth Fusion Systems. Joe, welcome. Hi, hey, Faith. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to talk today because you're a very interesting company that you're talking about today. Yeah. You're talking about Commonwealth Fusion Systems. Tell me what it is that y'all do and, yeah. and break down fusion energy for those who might be unfamiliar. Okay, cool. So Commonwealth Fusion Systems, we're a spin out of MIT in 2018. Right now, we're the world's largest fusion technology company um, so so let's let's rewind like what's fusion fusion is what powers the Sun and the stars it's the opposite of fission fission you're splitting the atom fusion you're trying to merge two molecules and when you do that you release a ton of energy I like to say like fusion is like going into a mosh pit or a rave you got to get hot next to each other bounce around for a lot and then you unleash a ton of energy Okay, that is a very good description. I like that, and I like the dance that goes along with it. Thank you. Tell me, though, we're here at the world's largest tech conference. Yeah. What is an energy company doing here? Why is CES this year? Yeah, well, you, you know, of course, that CES used to stand for the Consumer Electronics Show, and now it stands for the Consumer Everything Show, including Fusion. So part of my job... <laughs> Well, I am the CMO, so part of my job is to basically tell the story of fusion and also do a bit of myth busting where fusion, the myth is that fusion is always 30 years away, it's actually two years away. So we're building a demonstration machine called Spark outside of Boston, it's about 70% built or complete and we're going to turn it on in 2027 and show the world the promise of commercial fusion energy. Fascinating. Well it's funny you touched on this a little bit, but just five years ago, fusion was seen as kind of this distant idea, this distant dream, if you will. Yeah. As of today, investments in fusion have grown nearly tenfold yeah. since then. So what's changed in such a short amount of time? Yeah. Can I geek out for a little Please. bit? Please. Okay. So up until 1920, the world thought that this, what powered the sun was coal. Right? So this is during like the Age of Enlightenment with Einstein and Darwin and others. And in 1920, this British physicist named Sir Arthur Eddington penned this letter that posited for the first time that what was really powering the sun and the stars was this process called fusion. So now if you fast forward, so, so society has been working on trying to crack the code of fusion for 70, 80, or almost 100 years now, right? What's changed over the past five or 10 years are advancements in material science, um, having uh, large compute available, and then AI and machine learning. In our case, what we've been able to do is take this material called high temperature superconducting tape. It kind of looks like ta the tape from the 1980s cassette tape, but it's not. And so it was, it was invented in the 1980s, and in fact it won a Nobel Prize in the 1980s. So our team at MIT figured out that if you incorporated it into magnets, magnets for fusion, you could make incredibly powerful magnets that were smaller and more economical, and therefore you know, an easier investment for investors to make. Interesting. But you said smaller, but give me kind of a frame of reference. How how big are these magnets? They're actually not that big. The one the one prototype that we built and tested in 2021 is like the size of like this stage, maybe a little bit smaller. Oh. Like the size of your I've not seen your dining room table, but like the size of your dining room if table. If I had a, a bigger apartment, I would have a <laughs> dining room table this size. Sure, it's not that big. I'd say the size of like a full size bed. Exactly. Or perhaps. Exactly. Okay. So that one magnet is so powerful that in theory it could lift an aircraft carrier out of the water. So imagine the size of your bed or dining room table lifting an aircraft carrier out of the water. Okay. Right. So now when we scale up to the, the machine called Spark, demonstration machine, those those magnets are uh, probably like, you know, twice as big, right? So not, not very large. Um, so the whole idea is that we want the, the footprint for a fusion machine, a fusion power plant, to be small and, and, uh, because it's able to be located anywhere in the world. Right, right. Well, that kind of leads into what I was going to ask next, which is how close are we really, you said 2027 is, yeah. is, is the launch point, but how close are we to commercial fusion becoming a more widespread reality? Yeah, we're, we're close. I mean, within this administration, we'll break ground on our first commercial uh, fusion power plant. Mm. So in the past year, we announced we'll build our first commercial power plant, which is called ARC, outside of Richmond, Virginia. Dominion Energy is our utility partner there. And then Google is already committed to buy half the power. And the Italian energy company called Eni, e and i is also committed to buy power from that. So we're already actively in the market selling clean uh, fusion power uh, to customers. Wow. 
Well, it's something that people are calling humanity's power move. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, those people are us. <laughs> that's that's our uh, our tagline. That's our, our spirit. But the way we think about it is, um, if you think about fusion energy itself, right? It's it's abundant, unlimited energy. It just no one has been able to crack the code. So so think about the constraints of energy today, right? Even on a very simple level, in the you know the 1970s, President Carter told everyone to turn their thermostat back to 68 and put on an additional sweater in the wintertime? Or have you ever had one of your parents yell at you when you were a kid, All close the, the refrigerator door, or turn, turn off, off the lights? Turn off the lights. Right? They used to charge me money. <laughs> right? <laughs> so when you have a world of limitless or unlimited energy, yeah. right, if you wanted to, you could leave the refrigerator door open. But more seriously, right, think about um, clean energy from fusion, then also being able to power industry, being able to power things like decent desalinization plants so you can generate more clean water for everybody and so it's just it, li it literally is a, a, an energy source that can power humanity for the rest of humanity fascinating your company has also been labeling that it's been labeled that this technology is the holy grail of clean energy why is this technology different than other you know ideas of clean energy that we've been hearing about for years because those those other uh, clean energies or energy forms in general, the, the, the code has been cracked. But if you think about it, the universe is powered by fusion, except here on Earth. So if, if society can crack that code, then we go from a world of energy constraint to a world of uh, energy abundance. Well, what would the world look like with commercial fusion energy? You touched on it on a personal level, but yeah. how would that change? What would the domino effect be? Well, let's think about it. Like, think about, um, think about 20 years ago when the U.S. was dependent on OPEC for oil, right? So, the U the, so in terms of energy security, the U.S. was dependent upon other nations and oil. Or think about the current situation in Europe where they're beholden on Russian natural gas. Or think about uh, in Japan after the Fukushima crisis, there was an existential question that that country faced whether or not to turn on their fission power plants again. So with fusion, right, it's technology that anybody can build once we build it and crack the code, but anybody can build it and then you're not dependent upon fossil fuels, you're not dependent on acreages for wind or solar, you're just dependent on basically a, a really low fuel source from uh, from to from water basically that then powers energy. Interesting. Tell me why should everyday Americans who normally aren't thinking about something like fusion care whether or not this technology spark yeah. succeeds? Well, there's several reasons. One is when I talk to high school students or I talk to college students, they have a pretty dystopian view of the world these days, unfortunately, because of climate change, because of political tensions, because of regional wars that they're reading about. So, so what fusion does for them is it gives them hope for the future. Here's to 2026. Here's to hope, Joe. Here's to hope. Joe, thank you so much for joining me in this fascinating conversation. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Yes. Once again, Joe Paluska is the Chief Marketing Officer of Commonwealth Fusion Systems. Thank you so much. For more CES content, be sure to head over to latimes.com or visit us on YouTube at LA Times Studios.